being trained to have these to which believe that murdering and having joy at the death of civilians is a good thing. Um, and to stop that training. Well, I think you, you hit the nail on the head um, because you have we have a first mission to destroy Hamas, nothing's gonna stop it. Because if you want peace, destroy Hamas. If you want security, destroy Hamas. If you want a better life for the Palestinians in Gaza who've been hijacked uh, by Hamas, destroy Hamas. Uh, all of that is a precursor to the question that you asked. You first have to get rid of the poisonous regime. Uh, as you did in Germany, as you did in Japan, yeah, in World War Two. These were two. There's no choice. There's no choice. So, yeah. exactly. but, but then look at what happened. What you had in Germany was denazification, or what you had in Japan under uh, Douglas MacArthur was a cultural uh, reformation. Uh, and Japan that you visit today is so different from Japan of the 1930s. Yeah, Germany that you visit today. So different from Germany of the 1930s. Well, is that possible in the Arab world? And I categorically say, of course it is, because we've seen it already in two places. We've seen it in the Gulf states, and we see that when you visit Dubai or when you visit uh, Abu Dhabi uh, or when you visit Bahrain, you see something entirely different. Sure. There was, in fact, a cultural change there. Uh, and let me say that that same thing is, in my opinion, happening. Uh, to a considerable extent, in Saudi Arabia, a de-radicalization of uh, these Muslim countries, these Arab countries, is <clears throat> some of it already took place, some of it is taking place. Yeah, but there's another country with a substantial Arab uh, minority where that is already taking place, and that's called Israel. Yeah, twenty percent of our citizens are Arabs, most of them Muslim. Right, uh, they serve on uh, you know. In, High places in the academy, the Supreme Court, and the Knesset, and so on. And I'm not saying that there are, there isn't uh, some radicalism there, but mostly there isn't. Right. In fact, they're integrated into the society. So we have to do the same thing. We have to demilitarize Gaza after the uh, uh, the destruction of Hamas, and we have to de-radicalize Gaza. That will take some time, especially work on the mosques and in the schools. That's where children are. You know, imbibe uh, their values. Yeah. And then we have to also rebuild Gaza, and I hope to have our Arab friends help in that context. Yeah. He was talking about de radicalization of Gaza and then rebuilding Gaza. How did you find the whole discussion? Bizarre. Netanyahu is not given to illogical sentences when he's speaking in English and to someone like Musk or Biden or whomever. But that was as illogical as anything I've ever heard, and his historical analogies are just preposterous. Germany and Japan mounted imperial threats to the West. Both were roundly defeated by an alliance of the West supplied majorly by the United States. Russians did the, the, the lion's share of the work in Europe, but we supplied them. They would never have sustained Stalingrad, for example, if it hadn't been that huge line of communications we developed before the war started with the British in Iran. And we were pumping everything from gas to trucks up that line into Russia. And of course, Murmansk, the more known one. So that was a colossal struggle. In some ways, you could characterize it as good and evil, though I wouldn't do that. It's too simple, but you could. What is he talking about the Arab and the Persian world for in that regard? Is he saying he's got to eradicate them or destroy them before they will come into the modern world and be like Israel? Oh, please don't be like Israel. I, I, I grant you that I'd like to see Riyadh brought into the modern world. I'd like to see MBS successful. So there's no analogy here. There's no metaphor even. There's no comparison. And then the second thing is, Listen to what he says he's going to do with Hamas. Mr. Netanyahu, I have news for you. As a 30-year-plus military professional, I have news for you. You are not going to destroy Hamas, period. You are killing a lot of people who really don't have a whole lot to do with Hamas, especially those children, but you are not going to destroy Hamas. So 
We destroyed the Japanese imperial state. We destroyed the Third Reich so thoroughly that its leader, the Fuhrer, committed suicide in his bunker. <laughs> You're not going to do that to Hamas. You are not going to destroy, destroy their Reich. You're not going to destroy their imper imperial uh, mindset. It's not imperial. It's a mindset of a small group of people who have been dispossessed, indeed are being dispossessed, and resort to terror in order to com combat it. You are not going to destroy that. You will never destroy that. Have we destroyed Al-Qaeda? Look at the bombs we dropped in Iraq and Afghanistan and elsewhere, Syria, Libya. Have we destroyed Al-Qaeda? Hell no. Ali Soufan knows Al-Qaeda better than anybody who speaks English. He's Lebanese by birth, but he's Lebanese-American, was an FBI agent. Talented guy. Al-Qaeda's grown. It's bigger than it was on 9-11. It's got more members than it had on 9-11. You do not destroy terrorism. So that was a preposterous answer. And I would love to hear how Elon Musk, if he's as smart as people tell me he is, I suspect that sometimes when I hear him talk, um, how he would have responded to that had he been free to do so, or if he did and it just didn't get recorded. Because that was an absurd statement by Netanyahu. In fact, it makes me think that what I'm hearing about him, that he's losing it, is more and more true. We had the National Security Minister of Israel. On Tuesday, he threatened to break apart the government if Israel does not restart its war with Hamas. What are these guys are looking for, in your opinion? Why they're so insistent on fighting Hamas when, in fact, they're not fighting Hamas? The mission is turning something else. How many Hamas forces have been killed? Even if the Israeli figures are correct, and let me, let me preface these remarks with I never never ever believe Israeli figures. I've been in the government too long to know that the Israelis are patent liars in their intelligence community, in their propaganda community, certainly, and in their leadership, they are inveterate liars. Let me say that again, they are liars. So you can't believe anything that comes out of Jerusalem. It's all propaganda if it's during a conflict time like it is right now, and it's rarely ever true. But your question is a good question. I doubt very seriously that they have killed more than through uh, uh, several hundred, perhaps. Probably, in my estimate, less than that. Real fighters. That means there's a whole lot of them left. But if there's one left, the idea is left. They're not going to destroy them. They're not going to destroy them. So here's the dilemma I have with his comments and his strategy. Although I know what his strategy underneath is, it is to kill as many Palestinians as possible, get them off as much of the land as possible in Gaza, and release Ben Gavir and his settler contingents, whom they're now arming. They're, they, they were carrying shotguns and old rifles before in the West Bank and killing Palestinians with them. But now they're arming them. They're arming them with state-of-the-art firearms. They're going to move in as soon as things quiet down and the rubble's a little less smoky. They're going to move in and start colonizing Gaza the same way they've colonized the West Bank. They're doing East Jerusalem and the Golan. And East Jerusalem, I heard from one of my Christian friends in Jerusalem, who incidentally said to me in 2002, I think it was 2002, when Powell went to Ramallah to meet with Arafat the first time, he said to me, Larry, the most dangerous enemy we have in this region, this is a Christian prelate. The most dangerous enemy we have in this region is the Jews. I'm not saying that to be anti-Semitic. He said, it's the Israelis. They are our biggest enemy. I fear them. I fear them confiscating my land. I fear them confiscating the church's money. I fear them all the time. I fear them more than anyone else. I said, Bishop, you got to be kidding me. He said, no, no. The number one enemy of my church in that region is Israel. So Jerusalem is getting ready to explode. East Jerusalem is getting ready to explode from, from everything I'm hearing. He's going to do the same thing in Gaza. His strategy is clear now. He had none in, in, originally, but now he's an opportunist par excellence. So now he's going to colonize Gaza step by step, acre by acre, the same way he's done the other areas and is still doing the other areas. And we're going to sit back once the ceasefire occurs and it's permanent and no one's dropping bombs or whatever. We're going to say, oh, look, everything's fine now, just like we do with 
been doing for the last 20 years. And he's going to continue to march. But Daniel Levy said something today. I think he was in Lisbon. Uh, Daniel's a smart guy. You may know him. He, he was uh, at the European uh, Parliament for a while in their foreign relations group. And now he's head of the Middle East group that's in London. And Daniel said, and I, I want to quote it to you. The outside world must walk Israel back from the abyss. It cannot be a part of the choir of incitement. Well, I wanted to say to Daniel, and I, I, I did send him an email, Daniel, that's, that, that's exactly the way I feel except for one thing. The only people in the choir of incitement are the United States and some of its allies. The rest of the world is increasingly outside that choir. And singing a song that says like Erdogan today, Mr. Netanyahu, what did he call him? The Butcher of Gaza, he called him. That's a head of state anchoring the southern flank of NATO, however tentative of that position might be right now, saying to another leader of another state in the Mediterranean, you're a butcher. Now, you can't go all much longer in the choir if that's what you're saying. So Erdogan isn't in the choir. And if you look around the world, there are quite a few leaders now who've said what they've said, and they aren't in the choir either. So my only change to Daniel, my, my, my suggestion uh, was, you know, we're the choir. We and a few of our allies are the choir. No one else is singing this tune. Listen, we're becoming as much a pariah as Israel. We're becoming a much of a, a subject of detestation. There's no better word for it as Israel is. We're becoming a pariah. And we've already lost so much of our reputational power with torture, with a uh, war crime in Iraq, war crimes in Iraq, with the war in Afghanistan, 20 years of bloodletting and nothing to show for it, with the disaster in Libya. We're in Syria against the head of state of a constituted state. He doesn't want us there. And we're just there. And we're there for nefarious purposes. We're protecting oil flowing to Israel. We're protecting oil flowing to Israel. Forget about fighting ISIS. That's why we're there. So this is crazy. This is insane. We're becoming isolated. We're becoming a, a, a superpower that has no friends. That's no way to live in the world. Not in today's world. Not when you need cooperation and collaboration to meet a number of challenges. Not the least of which is nuclear weapons. Found a new life now and the climate crisis. You can't do these really existential tasks if you're bogged down in all these things that are just the subject of your stupidity. And Daniel said something else. I listened to another man too, yesterday on a webinar. I got to get his book. His book is called The, uh, the Lost Peace. He's a professor at Kent in Kent University in England. He's written a number of books on Russia, Richard, Richard uh, Sakwa. And he said, let me let me quote him because this this is this is just so good. He said, the irresponsibility of Western leadership, this is a direct quote, the irresponsibility of Western leadership is one of the striking, bizarre features of the post-Cold War world. He's absolutely right. And he said, the amazing lack of imagination in Washington, DC stuns me. Bingo. Uh, true. I listened to Tony Tony Blinken about an hour ago. The The press conference was about four hours old when I listened to it. And I listened to the people asking questions in the audience. I wanted to say, I want to jump in their chair and ask the question myself because they're so freaking ignorant, these newspaper people. They never ask the right questions. They never follow up with the right question. They, don't, they just sit there and prate. The answers that he gave, in, even under those circumstances, were so inconsequential. So demonstrative of what Richard is saying, a lack of imagination. Oh, everything is going to be all right. We're going to get our hostages back and we're going to probably extend this ceasefire a little bit and everything is going to be all right. I mean, they've got to destroy Hamas. They, Mr. Secretary, did you hear what you said? They've got to destroy Hamas. Let me tell you, it is an utter impossibility to destroy Hamas. You can't destroy Al Qaeda. You can't destroy ISIS. You can't destroy Lashkari Taiba, Jamaa Islamiya, any of these terrorist groups the worldwide who have a reason to be terrorists. You can't destroy them. 
you'd have to go in and eradicate their children, eradicate their babies, eradicate the idea, most of all, that they're opposed to India or opposed to Pakistan or opposed to the leadership in uh, wherever, Myanmar, Burma, whatever. You can't eradicate people. Mr. Secretary, are you listening to yourself? Are you listening to yourself? You're stating the impossible as a objective of diplomacy and foreign policy of the number one power in the world. Are you listening to yourself? And Jake Sullivan's no better. If anything, he's more lacking imagination. Um, and Biden, Biden is no better. Uh, Joe Biden is, is a cretin as far as I'm concerned when it comes to his ability to affect diplomacy. I've got to say, it must be his age because I know Joe was not all this bad you know, he wasn't the greatest in the world, but he was not all as bad when he was on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. So something is the people surrounding him. It's his age or whatever. But again, I come back to Richard. There's no imagination. There is absolutely no thought about reality. There's just thought about this world that they think they live in and they do not. There's nothing more dangerous than that, especially when you're possessed still of so much latent power. And you don't know what to do with it, and you don't know how to wield it, and you don't know how to use it. And that's where we are now. That's where Washington is today, leaderless in all for all intents and purposes. And we got a country at the head of the Levant that's so small, so tiny, that you could probably put New York's Jewish population in it and double it. And it's leading us by the nose as if we were a bull in a china shop with a ring in that nose. And Netanyahu's the leader. And this is preposterous. It's utterly preposterous. We've got, Levy said it right, we've got to stop. We have got to stop this. Israel, Israel's on the edge of the abyss, I agree. I don't think Daniel's right. I don't think we're going to stop Netanyahu, and I think Israel's going to go into the abyss. That's the reason I said two years ago that in 20 years, Israel wouldn't be a state. I think it may happen even sooner because you cannot go on the way they're going. This isn't South Africa. This isn't South Africa. You know, you could bring uh, Barbudi out of prison and make him head of the PA, and you could say, well, look, we did the same thing that uh, South Africa did. You know, they brought their man out of Devil's Island. We brought our man out of jail, and he's going to be the PA leader, and we're going to have a two-state solution, and he's going to make sure that on that side there's some leadership. Well, they're never going to do that because they know Barbudi's smart. He's not a Mahmoud boss. And Barghouti will actually build the Palestinian Authority into some kind of power that can actually negotiate and come up with a deal. That's what they fear. And so they're not about to do that. They're not about to allow him. But he may do it from prison. He may run from prison. You may, may have seen that Abbas sent his emissary there recently to try and talk him out of standing for the position because they know he'd get elected. The polls are showing that he would get elected. That would be a smart leader in the PA, and the PA then could provide some real leadership for Gaza and uh, other Palestinian groups. And you might, if you if the Israelis accepted that, you might have a, a possibility of affecting some kind of peaceful solution. That's what we're after. We're after peace. Netanyahu is not after peace. As Joseph Avazar says every Sunday, every Sunday on our IP, every other Sunday, on our IPC simulation, the Israeli-Palestinian Confederation simulation now running for two years. They're not interested in peace. That's Joseph's whole motivation in doing what he's doing, proposing this government over the other governments in Israel, is because he said the governments that exist, Hamas, PA, and Israel, are not interested in peace, and they proved it for 40 freaking years. Therefore, I want to impose a government on top of them who's sole purpose in life is peace that's, that's the only way you would ever do it and so what we're proposing is almost fantastic because netanyahu and the israelis would never allow it how influential the biden administration could be to extend this humanitarian pause that is going on right now is that possible in your opinion it'll all depend on the calculations that are aided and abetted by the israeli intelligence people and the idf and others and netanyahu's judgment of those evaluations as to how much advantage he can gain from that and that's political advantage because he's being really harassed by people who have relatives that are hostages 
both externally and internally. And I'm sure he cares more about the internal ones than others, regardless of what he might say. So it'll depend on his domestic political calculations and where he is in his strategy of leveling enough of Gaza that Ben Gavir can have success when he gets in there. Um, and there are others. I, I keep singling out Ben Gavir because he's kind of the head guy right now. He's the face at the head of it all. But there are lots of others, too. So when he unleashes those people and they start colonizing northern Gaza and keeping the people in the south of Gaza from returning, um, then we'll see what, what unfolds in terms of opposition to that. Because I don't think they're going to be met with no resistance when they do that, too. But look what they've done in the West Bank and look what they're about to do in East Jerusalem. They're meeting resistance, but they're eliminating that resistance. In some cases, they're killing it. Um, so I think that's going to be his calculation. What advantage politically, domestically accrues to me and what advantage accrues to me in carrying out this now de newly developed strategy for Gaza. And I'll, I'll decide on the humanitarian cause, if you will, its depth and its length based on that. But I'm not going to do a ceasefire because a ceasefire would fly in the face of all of that. It would not leave him at a point where he could say, I'm ready now. I'm ready to let everything go. We'll have a ceasefire maybe when that comes, but it's not. we're not there yet. He's not killed enough people yet. As he mentioned, he's looking for de-radicalization of Gaza. How you can kill people and turn each and every family into a potential member of Hamas? And how do you want to de-radicalize that? Is there anybody, is there any sector in the Biden administration giving some advices to Israelis? Are they taking, are they willing to take these advices? It's so important, this communication. I think there are probably some. I, I know one of them, and one of them with the most influential and even eloquent voice is Bill Burns. And I'm glad to see that even though he is malpositioned as director of the CIA to be the diplomat that he is, He's the only diplomat in the Biden administration, period. End of sentence. That's it. He's the only real diplomat. And he's kind of a Sergei Vieira, Sergei Vieira de Mello diplomat. He's very courageous, he's very brave, and he's very good. You know, Sergio was was probably the world's finest diplomat when he was killed in Iraq. Walked into the Pol Pot's camps uh, by himself, <laughs> affected a ceasefire with the Khmer Rouge. I mean, he was incredible guy east timor incredible diplomat well that's kind of the way bill burns is but he's so malpositioned right now but he's in the middle of it i understand he's in Qatar right now talking with the different parties with regard to the hostages and such but if he were if he were the top guy if he were the secretary of state we'd be seeing an entirely different approach in my view an approach we could explain and understand and that would show some imagination and would be bending Netanyahu's arm behind his back so bad that Bibi would be crying every night. But that's not happening because we don't have anybody with that kind of skill and talent and courage, moral courage. Um, so we're real, we're leaderless. So Richard's right. He's never seen anything so bizarre. And, and I agree with him. Post, we had a chance. His whole book about the lost peace, his whole book is the it's, it was when I was there at the heart of things. I saw Gorbachev. I saw Shepard Nancy. I saw Yeltsin. I, I saw Jim Baker and I saw Colin Powell and I saw Ronald Reagan and uh, to whom Powell was the final national security advisor and was on Long Island with Gorbachev, was in St. Catherine's Palace with Gorbachev when Gorbachev said, I know who you are in English. I know who you are Under, underneath that civilian suit is a uniform. Ah, what are you going to do now? Because your devil is gone. Yeah. Powell was convinced that this was a rare moment in history for us to effect a complete rapprochement as we ended the Cold War and didn't prate about it, didn't beat our chest about it. And his president agreed with him. He agreed with him completely. And his national security guy advisor, Brent Scowcroft, and Jim Baker, his secretary of state, agreed too. And we were embarked. We had every reason to believe Russia would be a member of NATO within a decade, at least the political alliance. And then eventually, if we kept it and we weren't sure we were going to do that, the military alliance and Europe would be whole in one. Finally, and everybody, you know, everybody's going to get along. Hell no. But 
it would be a different situation than anyone ever imagined. And it would be a concert of Europe that would uh, bring the kind of peace after Napoleon was knocked out. Uh, you know, a hundred years r roughly of no wars in Europe, no problems in Europe till you get to Hitler. Um, and then um, it just fell apart. It fell apart. And I, I, I know, I think why it fell apart. I saw it fall apart and I know it involved all manner of shenanigans by the United States from financial uh, shenanigans in Moscow that orchestrated the fire sale of the old communist industrial base to a few of the oligarchs for incredible prices and fees, um, to Yeltsin's uh, irresponsibility as a leader. Uh, but most of the blame lies, in my view, with Bill Clinton and the presidents who succeeded him and brought the Cold War back. And that's, I assume, what the subject of this book is. I can't wait to read it. Um, but what a loss that was. What, what a colossal loss that was. And fundamentally, the fault lies with Washington. The fault lies with Washington, just as the fault lies with Washington for what happened in Ukraine. I'm not excusing Putin's invasion, but I am saying that's why he invaded. He just made a statement. His statement in Russian translated, I'm told, I don't speak Russian, was that it's not about territory. It's about security. And he said it in some frustration. An imaginative diplomat in Germany, in France, oh God, in Washington, would have leapt on that like a dog on a bone and said, the man is telling us that he doesn't want Ukraine. What he wants is security. What he wants is no nuclear capable missiles on Ukraine's border pointed at Moscow. Do you know how short a distance that is? What he wants is no creep into his sphere of influence. No creeping into Georgia. No creeping into Ukraine. None of that. That's what he's telling you. You have the, the, the foundation for negotiations in a ceasefire right now. That's all you need. Go do it. Eat some crow and do it. Do we have anybody in Washington with the imagination, with the talent, with the juices of a real diplomat to do that? No, we don't. They don't even recognize what he said. Recently, Lloyd Austin visited Kiev. What are the reasons behind this trip? I frankly don't know. And I, I'm not impressed with Austin either. So I, I, I don't know. But if I were the Secretary of Defense and I could get the imprimatur from my commander in chief, that is to say, I wouldn't be violating too badly his idea of what his policy is, I would be talking to the Zelensky in the manner that I just described. Putin just made this statement. You're not going to lose any territory. We're going to have to eat some crow, the most indigestible portion of which will be we'll have to recognize Russia's sovereignty over Crimea. But we're going to trade Kosovo for that. You know, if if you'll recognize Kosovo, you never have. We'll recognize your sovereignty over Crimea. And oh, by the way, we'll sign up to whatever you and Zelensky can agree to. And we'll turn to Zelensky and say, you better agree to it with regard to the Russians in the eastern part of Ukraine who might still want to be a part of Russia. I'm not sure there are too many that want to do that now and have some kind of referendum. And if we have to, we set up some kind of DMZ. If there is a, a division between Russian speakers and they're wanting autonomy or affiliation with Moscow or Kiev and no autonomy, whatever they want, if we have to set something up and put troops in there from the UN, to monitor it for a while, 75 years is okay with me as long as no one's getting killed, then let's do it. But let's come to a solution. I don't even think now after hearing what Putin said and understanding as I do now, just how deep and how capable Russia's industrial base is. For a while there, I had some concerns about it because I, I knew from my conversations with old Warsaw Pact generals and Powell's conversations with them, that they were afraid that that colossal industrial base that they had maintained, and it is colossal. There's only two other countries in the world that equal it. China now probably surpasses it slightly in certain areas like shipbuilding. And us, and we're way third. We're way third, our industrial base. We, couldn't, we can't build but about one ship a year. <laughs> Chinese can build six a month. 
So that's how much their deep defense industrial base is as compared with ours. Russia's has been taken out of mothballs, if you will, and oiled, and it's working fine now. They are making so many artillery rounds now, they could shoot them from now until doomsday and not run out. That's the Russia I know. That's the Russia that Stalin bequeathed to everyone with this hardcore um, conventional industrial base. And of course, then they built the nuclear too. But it, it's just so one-sided now. And Putin knows that. He knows that. And I look today, the, the, even our Western analysts are saying their growth is 2.5% in this past fiscal year. Uh, it was going to be zero. It was going to be less than zero. They were going to tube, you know. They're not tubing. They're not tubing at all. In fact, in some ways, their economy has learned from and is doing better because of what we've done to them in terms of sanctions and everything. This is crazy. This cannot go on. It should not go. It can go on because we've got idiots in Washington. But it should not go on. It's not. People are dying and they've lost. And the time is ripe for making that loss not quite as bad as it could be if we let another year go by. We let another year go by, the whole dynamics may change. And Putin may change his, his statement and may say this is about territory because territory equals security. And I need a little bit of your country. There is an article in Politico just recently is talking about the Europeans have to offer a Ukraine deal that Trump can't refuse. It seems that they have to bribe Trump to, to just backing Europeans to backing the war in Ukraine. They're assuming that Trump would win. Nobody knows who's going to be the next president of the U.S. And the Republican right now can can have the upper hand in the next election. Charles Koch just through all of his support and money, which is considerable, behind Nikki Haley. He very much disappointed, disappointed Rick DeSantis, who thought he was going to get it. Um, I never thought Coke would go with DeSantis, but I didn't think he would go with anyone. I thought he would just keep his powder dry and watch and influence things as they develop. But he is now committed to Nikki Haley. That means to me that he is determined, and he's a pretty astute guy. I don't care for him too much, but he's a pretty astute guy, and he's a multi, multi, multi billionaire. That means he's decided that the Republicans can win, but they can't win with Trump. And so he's going with Haley. He probably picked, uh, I won't say that she's palatable because I don't care for her at all. I know her as UN ambassador, and she just depressed me there. But he probably picked the least dangerous one of the Republicans out there, with the exception of Chris Christie, but I think he's done. He's 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 just not sellable as the chief executive. So I think probably that means Koch has determined Trump is dead, dead in the water, no matter what the polls say, no matter what New York Times Siena polls. And you, you know what the New York Times Siena polls are doing? They're fixing the polls to scare the Democrats so they'll go to the ballot box. That's that's old hat in America. And New York Times is the old hat. They, they ooh, these polls show that Trump's leading by 10% or 12% or 6% or, you know, whatever. That's to scare the Democrats and get them into the ballot box because that's the big problem they have with Dems, particularly now that Biden has alienated the progressives. And every day that goes by, that he shows no imagination with regard to Israel, he pushes another 100,000 progressives away from him. And he can't win without them. He simply cannot win without them. No Democrat can. So this is shaping up to be a, a, a real battleground election, I think, because I think it's going to be Haley and Biden or someone like Haley and Biden. I don't think it's going to be Donald Trump. Um, so that, if I'm wrong, let me come back and try to answer it. If Trump were to come back, I think Trump will be so dedicated, so committed to murdering his enemies as best and as fast as he can. He won't give a crap about Ukraine. He he won't even pay any attention to it. Now, the fiscal situation in this country is getting so bad that we actually have our treasury notes being dumped by the Japanese and the Chinese now. We have a trillion dollars worth of defense budget, actually the national security budget, which includes everything, is about 1.6 trillion. 
We have a trillion dollars shaping up for this next year in interest payments on our $33 trillion aggregate debt. Those two figures will eliminate any discretionary federal spending whatsoever. That's the reason the Republicans are looking at Social Security. That's the reason they're looking at health care. They're looking at anything they can find to cut, except the defense budget, which they love, because we are broke and we're living on borrowed time with other people borrowing our debt or paying for our debt, through our mainly through the Treasury notes. When they start dumping those notes to the point of you know really harmful measures, we're going to have to tuck ourselves in and do a lot of things very differently. And we're going to have to do it fairly swiftly, or we're going to have a crash that's going to make the 2007-2008 one look small by comparison. It's not going to be housing. It's going to be virtually everything. If that is threatening DOD, and it is, and they know it, not just the recruiting problems, but also the fact that they can't really solve those problems. I don't think they would anyway, but they'd want to pour, they'd want to double the bonuses they're paying. They'd want to pay these 18 year olds instead of $50,000, $100,000 to solve their recruiting problems. They were way short this year, short partially last year. They were way short this year, and the reserves were paying the reserve, Army Reserve was 40% short on its numbers. You can't keep doing that and think you're going to fight China. <laughs> You know, so Austin might be taking a different tack and Biden might have approved it with Zelensky. Like, we got to end this. We got to end this. We got to figure a way out and we got to have your help in doing it. He might be doing that because he knows how perilous his own physical situation is. Hell, you may, you probably saw for what the 16th or 17th year, the DOD couldn't do an audit. They couldn't pass an audit. That's because they're washing money that is wasted all the time. They can't do an audit because they have wasted that money. They don't want to fess up on what they've done. And they don't want to fess up on what that means in terms of the future. Because they know, regardless of how much money the defense contractors funnel into the Congress to get them to vote for more money for DOD, that if there's no money there, it ain't going to work. And that's where we're approaching. We're approaching a point where there's not going to be any money in the bank. How about Europe? Do you see any backup plan in Europe? There is an article in Politico, they're talking about that Europeans gonna buy ammunition for Ukraine from third countries. Well, first of all, they're just getting more Ukrainians killed. Probably some Russians too, but they're getting more Ukrainians. There'll be three Ukrainians killed for every Russian. So all they're doing is aiding and abetting Russia in killing Ukrainians. That's all they're doing. That should be unconscionable to them. But you know, how many of them are really military professionals? And how many of them have military staffs in their country that will go in and say, you have no clothes on, Mr. Emperor. You have no clothes. You're naked. We are not going to influence Ukraine to the point where they can win. Are you willing to march, Germany? Are you willing to march, France? Are you willing to march, Finland, Sweden, Norway? Are you willing to put soldiers in the field and go to Ukraine? And, oh, by the way, that would be a commencement of a world war. Are you willing to do that? I hope you're not. Um, and besides, I don't think that would influence it even then to the point where Russia would have to back off. They just have to double down. And when Russia doubles down, you're in trouble. You're in trouble. Uh, all of Europe's in trouble. Um, so I don't think that's going to happen. I go back to that same conversation I had with Powell in 1989 in Atlanta, Georgia, when he looked at me and he said, meet the Ron, Cole, Thatcher, the major, they're all gone. When Europe realizes that it has no leadership anymore, that has its feet in World War II and understands the debt it owes to the other side of the Atlantic, understands the, the, the situation, the way it developed and the way America late but came to rescue them. When there's no one in Europe who understands that, NATO's gone. The transatlantic relationship is gone. We since that, I think, and have tried to stop that gap or break, stop that breakup by creating all these side things like the Balkans, like Libya, in order to engage NATO forces and get them used to doing out of area operations and things like that, in order to put some cement back in where we knew the cracks were showing up and would show up even wider as leadership began to change in Europe, particularly in Germany and France and the bigger countries. That's going to happen. This has been a temporary um, a, a, a temporary cement, if you will, 
but it's very fragile and it's not going to last. I did a webinar with a Norwegian professor today and I had done two more with Norwegians before that, one with the Swede and one with the Dane. And these are people who teach their version of national security in their schools in their countries. And they're all questioning why their governments changed decades old policies, in some cases, Finland and Sweden and Norway, for example, of neutrality, and suddenly flooded into NATO, ran into NATO. You know, The Norwegians said, you know, we're going to have American troops on Norwegian bases, and the status of forces agreements allows those American forces to be independent of the Norwegian forces on whose base they are resident. That means judicial matters. You kill somebody in Norway and you're a Marine or a soldier, uh, you get tried in U.S. courts. You don't get tried in the Norwegian courts. Uh, that's the status of forces agreement we did in secret with the Norwegians. So we could put bases on their bases. This is unheard of in Norway. So there's a whole bunch of Norwegians who don't like this very much. That you might call them traditional Norwegians. I agree with them. I think it's nonsense that we're we're creating these kind of ties at a time when all these ties are going to go pop, 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 pop. They're going to go away, and they're going to go away rather rapidly, and it's going to be injurious to both sides as they go away so acerbically, so poisonously, and rather than you know sort of melting away over time. Um, the dissolution of NATO is very short, very short future, I think. And it, it, it's mostly because of Washington's overreach, of Washington's inability to understand where the world is now. It's a multipolar world with three distinct poles in this order of power, China, U.S., Russia. Now, find a little niche of power somewhere and you can put the U.S. back on top. But overall power, China's on top. U.S. is a very close second. Russia is a distant third. But nonetheless, with nuclear weapons and the stockpile they have, they are a pole. The rest, even, even the so-called BRICS minus Russia, they're getting pretty, you know, heady themselves. They're able to do things and influence public opinion, international opinion, and do things themselves. We're seeing that with their condemnations of Israel. Um, so the world's multipolar now. And John Mearsheimer and others like him, they think that's a dangerous world. Um, when it's multipolar, we'll have alliances here, alliances here, alliances here, and everybody will wind up, you know, going to war. I don't agree. I don't agree at all. I think we have two situations, nuclear weapons and the climate crisis, that require, existentially require, collaboration and cooperation. And if we don't do that, kiss us goodbye. The planet will continue, but we won't be here. Like the dinosaurs, we won't be here. We don't have cooperation, we don't have collaboration, and we don't have people sitting down with the requisite scientists and saying, okay, we're the first human generation in 5,000 years to be existentially threatened as a race. We have the technology and the knowledge to save ourselves from this catastrophe. Do we have the wisdom to do it? The answer to that question to this point has been no. We need to change that answer. Do you think, are we going to have these changes in the U.S. national security in which you're talking about democracies and autocracies instead of talking about cooperation? Especially when you're not really a functioning democracy. <laughs> we're, we're a farce in that regard, an absolute farce. If we are anything categorically in terms of political science, and the way nations are led, we're an oligarchy. <laughs> we are a corporate oligarchy. Look, just look at the power. Look at where the money is. Look at where the money comes from that goes and influences our legislature, goes and influences our Supreme Court. My God, we have Supreme Court justices who go off on gigs with billionaires. I mean, we are a corporate oligarchy. We're exactly what Benjamin Franklin, Philadelphia, and was well, 1773 or something like that, wrote about. If we ever gave, and he actually used this kind of language, if we ever give the status of humans and the rights accruing there too to corporations, we're doomed. What did Citizens United do but say that corporations were people and therefore were subject to uh, freedom of speech and therefore could give all the money they wanted to give in the dark if they wanted to to any congressman they wanted to give it to. I mean, that's where we are now. We are a corporate oligarchy and we're telling other people 
that they should be democracies. <laughs> We're a hell of an example. Mm -hmm.